We will now discuss traditional theories of the term structure of interest rates. These theories try to explain the shape of the yield curve. So if we have an upward sloping yield curve, what are the factors that explain this shape? These are the four traditional theories. Under expectations theory, we have two flavors, unbiased or pure expectations and local expectations theory. Then we have the liquidity preference theory. These two are related. We also have the segmented markets theory and preferred habitat theory. And these two are also somewhat related. Let's start with the unbiased expectations theory. And this is the most basic and perhaps the original theory that tried to explain the term structure of interest rates and the shape of the yield curve. This theory is also called the pure expectations theory. The primary point is this. According to this theory, the forward rate is an unbiased predictor of the future spot rate. To understand the statement, let's consider a simple example. Say we are at time zero and at time zero, the forward rate for this period. So the one year rate for a loan that starts one year from today, let's say that this forward rate is 5% and this other forward rate. So the one year rate for a loan that starts two years from today is 6%. According to the pure expectations theory, 5% is the expected spot rate after one year. In other words, if from time zero, one year later, we are here at time one, then given that the original forward rate was 5%, we expect that this is an unbiased predictor of the expected future spot rate. Similarly, 6% is the expected spot rate when we actually get to this point in time. A major implication of this theory is that our holding period return, or more specifically, our expected holding period return does not depend on the maturity of the bond that we buy. Say that we buy a bond with a maturity of five years and hold it for three years. So the bond's maturity is five years, but our holding period is three years. There is a certain expected return that expected return does not change if we buy a three-year bond. So if we simply buy a three-year bond, the expected return of the first strategy where we bought a five-year bond and held it for three years would be the same as the expected return on the second strategy where we buy a three-year bond and hold it for three years. And so this third strategy where we buy a series of one-year bonds. So if we say that we'll buy this one-year bond, then again another one-year bond, and again another one-year bond. So all these three strategies will have the same expected return. And that is one of the implications of the unbiased expectations theory. This theory can be used to explain any shape of the yield curve. So if the yield curve is upward sloping, then this is explained by the fact that the rates in the future, the expected future spot rates are higher than the spot rates today. Given what I have described, it should be clear that this theory does not consider risk. As we'll see later, a higher maturity bond obviously has more interest rate risk and investors would like compensation for that higher interest rate risk. But this particular theory does not accommodate that risk. That brings us to the local expectations theory, which is a little more rigorous version of the unbiased expectations theory. Here the expected return for every bond over short time periods is the risk-free rate. In other words, according to this theory, whether you buy a five-year bond or a three-year bond, the expected return in the short term is the same, and it is the risk-free rate. The underlying assumption or the reason is that 
bond pricing does not allow for traders to earn arbitrage profits. So the assumption is that the arbitrage condition holds because of which all bonds, regardless of maturity, should give the same return for short holding periods. In other words, there is no risk premium for short time periods. But the theory does accommodate risk premium for longer time periods. In other words, if a bond is being held for a relatively long period, then different bonds will have different returns. More specifically, a 20-year bond will have a higher return than, say, a 3-year bond. Even though the local expectations theory is more rigorous than the unbiased expectations theory, but it does have an issue. The issue is that it has often been observed that short holding period returns on long dated bonds do exceed those on short dated bonds. In other words, if we look at data over the last several years, then the return on a 20 year bond over a short time period tends to exceed the return on say a one year bond over a similar holding period. So what that is telling us is that the observed data violates what this particular theory is saying. Next we come to the liquidity preference theory which asserts that liquidity premiums exist to compensate investors for the added interest rate risk they face when lending long term and that these premiums increase with maturity. So what's the implication? Let's say that if we consider only the pure expectations theory initially and let's also say that we expect the short term spot rates to stay the same in the future. Then according to the pure expectations theory our term structure is going to be flat because we are expecting spot rates to stay the same in the future. But what the liquidity preference theory says is that investors will get a compensation in terms of higher return for holding longer term instruments which means that according to this theory the yield curve will slope upwards so there will be a certain compensation for holding a five-year instrument and there will be a larger compensation for holding say a 10-year instrument so note that as the maturity increases obviously interest rate risk is higher and investors are being compensated for that higher risk so according to this theory a forward rate provides an estimate of the expected spot rate that is biased upward by the amount of the liquidity premium. So if we are looking at this curve which factors in the liquidity premium then the forward rate is actually going to be higher than the expected spot rate in the future and the difference is because of the liquidity premium. The existence of this liquidity premium implies that the yield curve will typically be upward sloping. The term here typically is important because if the expected spot rates in the future are staying the same then because of the liquidity premium the yield curve will slope upwards. There is an extreme circumstance where the expected spot rates in the future are very low. In that case, it might be possible that despite the liquidity premium, the curve is downward sloping, but this is extremely unusual. So what is more likely is that if spot rates are not changing or not expected to change, even then we will have an upward sloping yield curve. Moving now to the segmented markets theory. According to this theory, yields are solely a function of the supply and demand for funds of a particular maturity and each maturity sector is considered a segmented market. So to make this somewhat simple, let's say that we are considering the one year maturity, two year maturity, five year maturity and ten year maturity.
This theory states that each of these maturities can be thought of as a separate market or a segmented market and in each of these markets there is a certain demand for bonds with this maturity. So for one year bonds there is a certain demand and there is a certain supply and the supply and demand drives the equilibrium interest rate for bonds with this maturity. Let's say that for 10 year bonds there is again a certain demand and there is a certain supply and it is the supply and demand which will drive the equilibrium interest rate for 10 year instruments and so on. So we can plot lots of supply demand curves and come up with the yield curve. This theory is consistent with a world where there are asset liability management constraints either regulatory or self-imposed. I'll give you a simple example. Let's say that in a given economy the demand for 10-year instruments is dominated by pension funds that have liabilities that have a duration of roughly 10 years. So obviously given that high demand we will possibly have higher rates because a higher demand will imply higher rates. There is a certain supply and there is a demand coming from the various pension funds and that will drive the interest rates associated with the 10-year instruments. Preferred Habitat Theory The Preferred Habitat Theory is similar to the Segmented Markets Theory in proposing that many borrowers and lenders have strong preferences for particular maturities but it does not assert that yields at different maturities are determined independently of each other. So as I mentioned earlier this theory and the earlier theory of segmented markets are similar. The difference is that with segmented markets the assumption is that in each segment the interest rates are determined independent of the other segments. So there will be buyers and sellers who are just interested in one particular segment and essentially they are wearing blinders. So they are not considering the interest rates in the other market segments. The preferred habitat theory relaxes that assumption and says that while a particular group of investors might have a preference for say one year bonds, but if the rate on two-year bonds is extremely attractive, they might shift to the two-year bonds in order to take advantage of those higher rates. If the expected additional returns to be gained become large enough, institutions will be willing to deviate from their preferred maturities or habitats. And that's why this is called the preferred habitat theory. Agents and institutions will accept additional risk in return for additional expected returns. So this is consistent with finance theory where if an institution is taking on a little higher risk by getting into a different time segment that it wasn't that interested in initially but is getting a tremendous amount of compensation then it will possibly move to a different segment.